thank you, Wojciech, for coming on and, and joining me on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, you are the co-founder or a co-founder rather of OpenAI. And uh, prior to that, spent some time um, at Google and at Facebook and have been doing math and uh, you know solving math problems and things like this since you were a very young kid. Um, so, you know, one of the, you know, foremost researchers and, and just people in general in the AI space right now, and also, um, spent a lot of time working on robotics, um, some pretty cool videos I was able to see of, you know, robots solving Rubik's cubes with one hand and things like this, um, things that you've been working on. And, and of course, like GPT-3, uh, open AI's, uh, you know, recent product, uh, or I guess a couple of years ago now, but, um, still, a lot of hype around that that product. So um, great to have you on it and looking forward to the conversation and, and going way past my depths in, in AI. Uh, but before we dive in, it would be great to hear, you know, your story uh, from as early as you're willing to start to where you are today and uh, some of the decisions you made along the way. Cool. Um, thank you, Jake, for having me here. Let's see. I mean, I, I, I like looking back at my childhood and I would say, by for sure it was somewhat unusual i would almost say that if i would have a kid doing the things that i was doing as a kid i would be somewhat worried about them um but i guess otherwise i wouldn't be who i am so let's see so definitely hmm Definitely from early age, I was extremely passionate about science uh, and um, and I was fortunate to actually uh, run into teachers who 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 allowed me to further develop. Um, that means that let's say when I went when I was at school, if you know when I finished my exercises, teacher just gave me the next one and next one and next one and next one. Uh, instead of saying, kid, uh, wait until other kids uh, will fi finish. And uh, uh, like I, instead of slowing me down. So I remember that initially I was extremely motivated by mathematics. And, uh, you know, I just finished all the exercises from the first grade, second grade, third grade, and so on. And, and that kept on going for a few years. And maybe around fourth grade of my elementary school, I actually, I ran into a teacher who, when I was trying to solve some math problem, told me that I'm stupid. And literally she, like uh, as far as I recall, she said to me that I'm stupid. And uh, I would say for a kid that was quite devastating. Like I didn't want to do mathematics anymore. And uh, I actually, I, I switched to chemistry it also felt uh, very compelling to me it felt that you know all of a sudden you can actually uh, create something tangible and uh, actually i started building out laboratory in my basement uh, soon actually basement was full of chemicals uh, like uh, some nearby school uh, was getting uh, like uh, the, the getting closed or so and they I was able to actually acquire their entire chemical laboratory over the time I just filled up the full two full basements with uh, chemicals I had like hundreds of chemicals and uh, you know I, I just did all the experiments that they describe in the uh, in the book for like elementary and high school and at some point hmm, you know, I felt that I'm that that's like uh I, I did everything that I could. So I switched to actually uh working on explosives. And I would say explosives they were quite interesting because you can also visually see the outcome of uh what you are doing. So I remember, you know, at at first it was I, I played with a friend of mine, uh with creating gunpowder and uh, that was fun uh, i mean the the guy the the guy actually even uh, 
kept on working on the kind of musket, like a, a gun kind of a thing. And uh, we were like a, essentially uh, shooting uh, paper from it. Sometimes actually we're even shooting uh, bullets that we uh, that we created actually ourselves. We're just shooting it into a, a wall or so. And then alongside, I actually, I started uh, working on stronger uh, explosives. I remember, yeah, I, I, I synthesized nitroglycerin. I actually, I even remember the time when I have done it for the first time. And uh, I remember it. I, I get, it turns out that in case of explosives, you can just put them on fire and they burn. And uh, you need initiator to detonate to detonate them. So I remember, you know, I remember that time when I was a kid, you know, burning nitroglycerin and it burns like a, a I think, blue color. And the, still that friend was skeptical about actually that I will be able to make any serious explosives. And actually soon after we created a bunch of significant explosives, it's kind of almost crazy that, you know, I remember times as a kid, you know, carrying in my backpack, uh, I don't know, kilogram or so of dynamite and going on the brinks of the city to to detonate it. And uh, I would say, apart from some uh, minor, uh, I would say, accidents, nothing happened to me. I... I, I I, I haven't injured myself. And at some point I got bored with with actually chemistry. And uh, I came back to math. And I became again actually obsessed about math. I remember um I remember actually you know like uh, I I remember I I was essentially at some point I uh uh I was very keen to go to to math Olympiad. Uh, that the, there was just like a tremendous amount of beauty and satisfaction in solving uh, mathematical problems. Uh, and even toward the end of my high school, uh, I actually I stopped going to school to focus on math Olympiad. And uh, you know it actually worked out. I I. Uh, uh, that year, uh, uh, I was second in Poland. I represented uh, Poland on Math Olympiad internationally. Uh, I got the silver medal. I was very happy about it. Um, I first time visited Asia. It was in Vietnam. And uh, I guess that's pretty much the short story of my elementary and uh, elementary school and high school. I can I, I can keep on going, but I also don't want to be in that too long of a monologue. No, oh, yeah, that was that was great and uh and super interesting. Certainly not a uh traditional childhood. And I was wondering when you first said, you know, if your kid was doing some of the things you were doing, you might be a little worried about him. I was wondering what that was going to lead to, but then you talked about, you know, carrying around a bunch of dynamite in your backpack and I realized, oh, okay, so this is this is why you might be a little worried, but fortunately no accidents and uh you know presumably lots of learning from math to chemistry and back to math and i'm sure studying some other things all the while um i guess one sort of question and then i would love for you to sort of resume from you know the the end of your childhood towards um you know your time at at facebook and google and eventually co-founding open ai uh but before you get that to that maybe you could speak a little bit to like it seems like you were very good as a kid at sort of, um, you know, following your obsessions. And uh, I think this is a characteristic of a lot of extremely successful people that they just dive full into their obsessions. And, um, you know, hopefully their, their obsessions are somewhat like fruitful. Um, but I think anything that you just put enough time and practice into, you tend to get you know, very good at those things more so than anyone who's not truly like sort of obsessed with this thing could, could get by like forcing themselves to work on it. But you also like mentioned, you know, the one teacher had the nasty comment. And so you got sort of turned off from math for a while and then obsessed with chemistry. And then 
got bored of chemistry and turned back to math. I'm curious if you can sort of speak to, you know, how you navigated these transitions of like obsession and then boredom and switching paths and whether that's sort of maintained into, you know, your life since uh, as an adult. Um, so that's sort of one thing, maybe you could speak a bit to like obsession and, and boredom generally. And then secondarily, just sort of following up and, and telling the rest of your story. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a huge believer in, uh, in on, on some level, and that might almost like a sound inappropriate or wrong, but I'm a huge believer in actually having people do what they want rather what rather than what they should. And I'll say maybe I was even unaware that that's how I'm choosing the things as a kid. Uh, but that's how I was choosing the things as a kid. And fortunately, I had an environment in which uh, that was uh, that was allowed. You know, for instance, I don't recall situation of being punished by my parents. Okay, I could see maybe my mom being sad, uh, but frankly, it was up to me to decide what I want to do with uh, my time. I was never forced to actually uh, uh, learn, and uh, I think that uh, that. Uh, when we force ourselves to do something or when we do something against our own will, we are effectively training ourselves not to like it. Uh, it was quite apparent to me when I looked, uh, say, at my nephew. And, you know, he is extremely curious about the world. And uh, I, I can... Uh, and... and, and, and I can see that actually forcing him to do math uh, makes him hate it, while uh, when he just does what he likes, uh, then he spends uh, many, many hours. And I think that's actually true for anyone. Uh, I'm not totally sure if it's possible for anyone to do what they like. Uh, I would like to believe that it's actually possible. Uh, I can move to the maybe the next stage of my life. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. And and uh, I'll just say briefly, I, I love what you said about, you know, doing what you want as opposed to what you should. Um, I think that's great advice for people that's, you know, like you said, maybe not everyone can do this, but I think a lot more people can do a lot more of what they want than they think. And we sort of tell ourselves that we don't have choices that in fact we do have. Um, we just sort of are quick to rule out a lot of options, for example, you know, we might assume that we need to live at some, you know, high cost of living. But in fact, if you're willing to give away, you know, living in a high cost city and eating out at restaurants and things like this, then you don't need as much money, then you could probably don't need the same job that's as demanding and requires many hours. And then you can spend your you can have a lot more free time doing what you want. It's, it's all just choices, I think. I very much agree. Um, very, very much agree. Um, yeah, let me actually even add a little bit to this statement about uh, once the I think that actually just uh, doesn't even apply to passions, but I would say uh, that's one of the uh, almost like a a way how you can live your life, almost principles. So um, on the one hand, you might think that actually following your wants uh, would make you dysfunctional or uh, selfish. And I would actually almost claim that uh, uh, what happens is when people connect with their uh, wants, um, then these wants, uh, th 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 like a, sometimes, first of all, uh, I actually think that the, often when someone says that 
uh, other person is selfish, it actually just means that this other person is not doing what they want. So uh, I would almost say that on some level, I encourage people to be selfish and to look deep inside what is the most interesting, important uh, to them and what is their truth and just fully follow it and actually have courage to it. And then uh, the interesting thing about wants is that in my experience, they uh, they uh, evolve. And in some sense, I would almost say like if someone believes, oh, my want is to have uh, to get more money, then I would almost say just give a try and then it will transform. And I would say, instead of saying, you shouldn't be wanting that. Um, that's my take. Um, let's maybe, I can, I want also to speak about AI and so on, don't want to be too much focused about my childhood or so. So let's see. I went to university and uh, actually one of my false beliefs uh, for, for a while was that if I'm good in mathematics, then I will be great in everything. And uh, it actually, uh, you know, at some point I just realized that this is false. And that was actually quite depressing to me. Uh, it's almost, I kind of, then I, 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 I had to figure out again, what's the meaning of life? or so and um, I also remembered I was quite uh, like a, I, I lost interest in computer science I, I, I was also programming uh, throughout my childhood I lost uh, interest in computer science after visiting actually some software company here in California and then feeling like a uh, just as a small part of a really big machine. And it just wasn't pleasant uh, building a software in the corporation where actually documentation is crappy, where things are breaking. And uh, I remember that was, uh, let's see, challenging uh, for me. And uh, at some point... Um, uh, I discovered uh, actually uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so artificial intelligence was a combination for me of, you know, the skills in which uh, I'm pretty good, which is mathematics and computer science. And simultaneously, you can build this like a almost tangible, uh, tangible object that actually does uh, things you know almost in the real world and um, it has also you know it was very clear to me right away that it has this like a uh, fundamental philosophical uh, consequences of you know so why, why are we here what is intelligence what what is consciousness uh, and even I recall, actually, on the topic of consciousness, I recall myself at the very, very early age, noticing that there is this thing called consciousness. And that was the biggest mystery in the world for me. Yeah. J j just want to give you, 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 you some space. Uh, I can also keep on going. Um uh, yeah, no, I can I can pick up from there. Um, I think it's actually interesting. I, I you know I want to get into how you, how you came to start OpenAI and and what the mission is and and what you in particular are working on. Um, but you brought up consciousness, and it's always interesting to me. You know, I'm not working in the space or anything like that, but um, consciousness is like this. It's this single word that keeps you know. It's always brought up, and it's like the ultimate test it seems like can we make ai conscious and what is consciousness and you know is it a black and white thing or is it a spectrum where animals are conscious and various things have varying degrees of consciousness 
And uh, to me, it's like, you know, it's, it's like, to, it's like the, the obvious question that everyone in the space talks about that to me is sort of odd. Um, like, I don't quite understand why, you know, to, to me, words like, you know, th there's a definition in Merriam Webster dictionary of consciousness, right? It's like just a word. It's, you know, it might be an important one, but I have a difficult time understanding, you know, another one is like, well, is AI going to be considered like a form of human or is AI going to be considered living? Um, but consciousness is this, this one that people seem to be like hyper-focused on. And so I'm curious from your perspective, like what is consciousness and why is that so important? If, if you agree that that is sort of like the most important test in, in the world of AI. Um, I wouldn't say that the, let's see. So, so let me maybe first give you a definition or what's my understanding of the word. I wouldn't say that that's the most important. Um, so for me, the definition is that consciousness corresponds to the subjective experience. So at this moment, uh, in this second, uh, you are having experience uh, of my voice. You might be seeing your computer screen. You might smell maybe your coffee or so. And in some sense, uh, there is also many things happening automatically. Let's say your body is uh, pumping blood. Um, however, there is just a fraction of the things that is happening it, uh, they are you are conscious of you are conscious of the smell my voice you know your display and you are not conscious of some other things and we can say that you know if actually um you like I, in some sense in some sense if you if no one in the universe would be experiencing the universe then it almost sounds to me as it wouldn't matter that this universe exists at all or to maybe put it differently if the things are happening which are not part of anyone's conscious experience by any remote ways it seems to me that they do not matter to us. Okay, so let me try to contrast it for you. Let's say it might be the case that there is a planet far away that in the core of this planet, there are like some chemical reactions happening, but we are not affected by it by any means. And the, the influence of these reactions won't actually impact our life at all okay and it won't actually change our own state then on the contrast i can say try to imagine that you in your conscious experience you feel tremendous pain okay out of nowhere you feel a tremendous pain and we can say that actually it seems that you care quite a lot in case of this pain, way more than about the things that you don't have experience of, which is the you know chemical reaction in the core of the planet. So I think that's where it stems from, that maybe people uh, 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 ascribe the importance of consciousness. And I would almost say that the... Uh, the thing that actually matters definitely to every human is their own conscious experience. Okay. It might not even matter if AI is conscious or not, uh, or if animals are conscious, but you can say that it matters to you how your day looks like, what, do, how the uh, plants that you smell smell, how tasty is the coffee to you how pleasant it is to speak with a neighbor. So that seems to me to be important. 
Yeah, that's that's a great explanation and definitely helps sort of further my understanding of of what consciousness is and and why it's important. Um, sort of like the the super dumb version, I think, is uh, you know, the old saying about like if the tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, did it even happen or does it even matter? Um, it's like the most simple analogy that I can think of to sort of the the concept, I think, as you described it, um, at least from my perspective. But uh I think it, it actually gives us a, a pretty good transition into some of the stuff that that you're working on at um at OpenAI. Uh in 2020, you guys released GPT three. And uh, you know, it was I remember my first time engaging with it. You can sort of just uh type back and forth for for those who don't know, GPT three is um, sort of like an, an AI that at least from like a common person point of view, it's like an AI that you can basically have a written conversation with, um, sort of like instant messaging or something like this. And, uh, you can also sort of set it up so that it can embody like a particular person. And so I remember I would set it up as like, you know, GPT three be like, you know, Socrates, and then you have a conversation as if like, you know, the AI is doing its best to have a conversation with you as if it is Socrates based on all of the information that it has. And, um, it was just an, an amazing experience and some, you know, you, you have a bunch of conversations and it becomes pretty evident pretty quickly that some are much better than others. Um, and some people, you know, were even convinced by, by this, that like, they're like so amazed and have, have no idea what's going on on the back end And, they're like, all right, you know, this AI is like a human now. Uh, this is like a conscious thing. Uh, there was recently, I think, a guy at Google who like made these claims about like ethical treatment of AI because he had thought that he had proof basically that that the AI was conscious or something like that. Um, but anyway, you know, independent of all that, I thought it was a good transition from consciousness, but I'm curious if you could just sort of lay the, the fundamental groundwork for, um, you know, what is GPT-3? How did you get there? And, uh, you know, I understand there's probably going to be a GPT-4 and, and so on. And uh, how do you expect this, uh, you know, line of work that, that I understand you're leading efforts for it at OpenAI, how do you expect it to evolve um, over time? Um, so, let's see. So, um, let me maybe tell you briefly about the mission and I, I will be I will be able to tell you what we try to achieve with GPT like models. Um, so uh, OpenAI would like to build general artificial intelligence and it would like to make sure that it plays well in the world that actually the results of this work, uh, benefit humanity as the whole. Um, so what do I mean by that? So uh, as you Jake uh, described uh, uh, GPT, this is a model with uh, whom, with which you can have a conversation, model can, you know, solve all sorts of tasks. Uh, it can even speak like a Socrates. The, so since that the model uh, has a general, some general uh, problem solving skills, uh, but still uh, it's not as capable as human is in uh, solving uh, problems. So um, it's, it's conceivable. And it seems that we are on the path of making these models uh, uh, have more common sense, more reasoning, more understanding of the world and being able to carry uh, more and more complex uh, instructions. So you could imagine that we'll be able to get to the point that you speak with this AI Maybe AI is playing a role of a Socrates or a school teacher or a therapist or a programmer or a scientist. And actually AI can, you know, teach a kid mathematics or 
it can you know be extremely compassionate uh, uh, a therapist or it can uh, help with medical diagnosis or it can write thousands of lines of code or so and uh, you know that sounds you know it actually evokes multiple emotions so it's like a, at least you know, there is maybe some excitement. There is maybe some kind of fear of what does it mean? And why would we do that? What's the, uh, what's the, what's the meaning of the human life and so on? And how the world will, uh, look like. And also I have some thoughts about this. Mm, that's makes sense. Yeah. Um, so would you like to just sort of continue as to, uh, you know, you mentioned you have, you have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. So let's see. So I want to, maybe at first I want to describe the, um, uh, the, cornerstone problem uh, that people consider in the field and it is called alignment and uh, yeah so let me maybe start here so um, so we will have this um, um, we'll have these models that can solve um, harder and harder tasks. And in some sense, the, the question is how to ensure that uh, these tasks uh, are exactly what humans would want them uh, to do. So that sounds like a little bit strange. What do I uh, mean by that? So, um, Try to imagine, for instance, that you hire an employee and you tell an employee, do this, do that. And you can say that there is a spectrum of employees. So some employees, they might really care about what you try to do and they would do an excellent job accomplishing your tasks. Um, while some other employees, they might just care about the performance review. So then they would actually do the things that uh, shows up at the performance review. Uh, uh, but then, you know, if you would investigate things deeper and deeper and deeper, you would actually find out that uh, they just uh, solve the work in the very quick way and they created a lot of paths around their accomplishments uh, to get more credit. And, you know, you have even the, uh, the, 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 the furthest spectrum where, um, where your employees would be totally uh, uh, deceptive, uh, that, you know, they would actually even hack into your performance review system and update the scores from, uh, from um, what you gave them to new values. So um, in some sense, the, the alignment problem, and, and you can see that actually in, in, in all these cases, you can see that it's almost like a, you attempt to teach the, let's say employee through some system of maybe reward and punishment and uh, which is performance review or salary or so and you can have a spectrum of behaviors uh, which each of them leads to high performance review however some of them correspond to desired behavior while other don't does that make sense yeah um i think I, just the last part i actually lost you a little bit um I understood the human analogy to you give a human, you know, an employee instructions and they either execute them 
excellently or they are sort of selfish seeking to optimize for their you know performance review or at the far end they might actually go and hack the system and change it and then i just missed how that converts to ai yeah so here the interesting thing is in the example that i gave you is in all three cases on the paper from perspective of performance review um this would correspond to having uh the 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 the, 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 the in three cases they would have a really high performance review mm -hmm. even though uh in the first one uh, they do what is very desired while in the further it's becoming less and less yep uh so this example just shows uh, that you can be in this situation that uh, you are training other person uh, towards what what you what you want them to do and they there's just a spectrum of outcomes that uh, you might get uh, even though they all on the surface they seem to be in all cases these employees they had the best performance right so in some sense the principal problem uh, with ai from technical point of view is this problem of how could we train AI such that um, when you know it in 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 its circuit when it return uh, uh, receives the reward, which is you know there is some analogy to this performance review, then actually uh, it will end up behaving in the desired way, the way how humans would like rather than uh, get the high score and not behave in the appropriate way. And um, and uh, the so, so, so you know we we have we have some way of telling system, you know, here is a reward for you for doing uh, for, 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 for doing uh, for solving that, that task. And the and, and in some sense, you know, the system might either learn to do tasks really exactly uh, how you want it, or it might learn to do tasks in the way that you would score them high, or it might learn even at some point, literally to hack into the system and to give itself a lot of reward because that's actually the way to get a lot of reward. I see. So it's like you want, you need to ensure that the AI is not basically gaming the system in a way where they're actually performing excellently as opposed to sort of doing the right things to produce a good score despite non-excellent excellent execution or worse yet, going in and hacking the system to give themselves these positive rewards? Yeah, so the problem that I described, it, it goes under the name alignment. And uh, as of today, there are plenty of ideas. What could we do better and so on? But I wouldn't say that there exists a, a single compelling solution. I can tell you what's the current approach uh, that we have at OpenAI to this problem or how you want to approach it. Yeah, that would be great. So um, so it's interesting that in this in the in case of alignment essentially you want to be able to recognize which behaviors you favor over which one not. And, you know, there is almost a risk that if you do it, if you are not subtle enough, then it will be exploited in some way. So you want almost to have a very deep understanding of when AI behaves in the desired way and truly rewarded. You don't want to just look at the surface level and say, oh, that's what I want you to do. Uh, because then AI might actually learn to exploit it. So the, the things that we were uh, investigating is uh, 
uh, actually leveraging AI in uh, the process of uh, essentially providing feedback to AI. So what do I mean by that? So let's say you have AI solving a problem and then the human has to decide uh, whether or not that was a good solution. Turns out that you can leverage AI to help a human to find mistakes in the solution, to point into uh, possible uh, shortcomings. And we demonstrated that this approach works. And in some sense, it's almost like you can think about it that let's say if we, uh, you can think about it almost like a from bootstrapping perspective. It's like a, uh, if, if, we, if we have a human at let's say IQ 100, then maybe they can give a really good feedback and they can understand mistakes of AI at, you know, IQ 50, 60, 70, 80, uh, 100, maybe 110. But then once AI becomes smarter and smarter, then it becomes more and more challenging being able to provide appropriate feedback. And what you want to do is actually combine the power of human and AI in order to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, ever more complex uh, feedback to AI. So it's almost like, a, let's say AI gets to IQ 110, then you can combine it with a human and human can all of a sudden provide the feedback on the level of 110 IQ. Then, you know, I, then, then AI gets to IQ 120, then you, you can once again combine human with AI to provide feedback on the IQ 120. And it's quite conceivable that this will work for some time, you know, hypothetically, maybe to IQ 200. Uh, but uh, we also don't think that it will work all the way to IQ, you know, 5000 or so. And uh, the next stage is leveraging AI to help in uh, alignment research itself. So that might sound a bit far-fetched. Uh, however, uh, I would maybe, like, uh, I can elaborate on it more, but I, I would like to maybe hear what, what you think so far. Yeah, I think so far it sounds like uh, the solution that you uh, think is, you know, maybe most, uh, you, you know, you said nothing was really super compelling, but the solution that you and uh, presumably OpenAI I think is most compelling as of yet is um, basically using AI to augment human intelligence in a way where you're combining the two and that that may work for, um, you know, addressing the issue of AI alignment up to a point around, you know, IQ 200 or so, and then uh, maybe further or something, but not up to 5,000. And so that becomes like a one, that's like a step one on the solution of AI alignment, but it doesn't go in perpetuity. And so in solving for what comes thereafter, you're speculating that, um, or, you know, not speculating, but your concept is that maybe AI itself can begin to take over on, on research of alignment on its own. Is that right? Yeah. So I would even say actually in case of, so, so even in case of the alignment research, I also think that it will be the case that human and AI will combine to uh, conduct this research. So it's almost like a, you have an intermediate stage where human and AI combine to provide the feedback to AI. And uh, then you will have yet another stage when where human and AI combine uh, to conduct alignment research. And uh, I just want to say, actually, uh, this vision just started to really become extremely compelling to me, and I started feeling it very much in my bones. So the thing is, uh, I was uh, recently uh, internally uh writing some web application 
And, you know, these days I do not code it that often. And then my coding skills, they become rusty. And I was never a web developer. And the uh, interesting thing is uh, now when I speak with the model about web development, the model, uh, it's extremely useful uh, for me to actually make a progress on this, uh, on this domain. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes just copy paste chunks of code and asking it to explain. I'm asking some questions. I'm asking how to implement given pieces and many recommendations. They totally make sense to me. Um, so the picture that I'm starting to have now in my head is that, uh, we will, uh, uh, that the you know, the, the, this AI that we are having now uh, has this like a property of uh, knowing about every single field. Then, you know, today it has, I don't know, some amount of IQ, let's say 70 IQ or so. This amount of IQ will be growing. The AI itself, as of today, it becomes a partner for me when I'm trying to solve tasks. And I believe that it will become a partner to, you know, to scientists at OpenAI in solving the alignment problem. I also believe that uh, uh, actually the future that is ahead of us is that uh, we'll see all sorts of businesses and uh, essentially people being augmented with uh, AI. So for instance, uh for instance i can uh i can imagine that you know both a shoe shop or a bio lab they will both you know be heavily uh, uh taking advantage of uh ai employees who can you know help with some tasks give some advices solve some problems that uh previously uh you know required external experts and I think that's the world that we are heading towards. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, it occurred to me as you were sort of explaining your experience where you're just sort of asking uh, AI, you know, for, well, I'm not sure what exactly the interface was and, and whatnot, but you're asking various questions about what you want to build and it's sort of giving you feedback and you're sort of copy and pasting code. Um, it seems like the human skills and you, you talk about, you know, humans pairing with AI on potentially alignment research is sort of like a corollary to, to what you're talking about here in, in this example. And in either of those examples and many others, it seems like the core skill or skills, um, maybe you have a different view on this or can augment it, but to me, it's like two of the, I've, I've always thought like most high level skills that are like above everything, basically to me are, are decision-making and communication. And um, obviously communication occurs in, uh, you know, your given language or however many languages you speak and, or, or can write and, and whatnot. And, you know, one thing that's happening here is like, so you're deciding, you know, how to communicate and you're taking the input from what it communicates back to you and making decisions based on that and sort of proceeding in some direction but you don't really require the knowledge you just need to be able to like ask the correct questions and communicate effectively and, and make decisions you know effectively as well um so maybe you have comments on on that like what what human you know why can't the ai just run with it itself why is the human pairing important and you know why do you expect it to, to continue to be important for some time? And then secondarily to that, um, it sounds like what you're talking about with the coding is, um, I don't know if it's directly or maybe indirectly related to, but the um, codex, uh, OpenAI codex and GitHub Copilot, which I think is, I think you're working on the GPT-3 stuff or GPT more broadly. And then- These, these are my babies. Yeah, exactly. Those are your two babies. So maybe we can touch on we talked about GPT, but maybe we could talk about your other baby 
uh, for a little bit as well. Yeah, so um, uh, Codex is the is essentially uh, GPT like model, but optimized for uh, excellence uh, when it comes to coding skills. And uh, Copilot is a product that we released together with uh, GitHub, uh, which is uh, embedded into editor to instantaneously help uh, programmers in coding. Um, so, um, so, um, Cop and, and Copilot today is used by um, millions uh, of uh, people. So definitely they have a the, the, definitely they have a property that they allow human to focus more on the high level task that they try to uh, solve, and the model itself can provide. Um, uh, uh, completions, which kind of resolve, uh, um, they, okay, in some instances, they remove the drudgery work of knowing exactly the syntax of a given library, uh, or, uh, or, 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 or like, a, you know, often the programming actually has to do with copy pasting, uh, something that has been done uh, you know, something that has been done before. And model is actually extremely good when it comes to uh, this kind of pattern matching and uh, removing this extremely repetitive work. Um, so let's see. So you said, uh, you, you, you said this thing about the, uh, that the, it's very important for that the human can do communication and decision making, why the machine won't be able to do it. Uh, so I think that the picture is maybe a little bit more nuanced, um, uh, in my opinion. So there is a variety of skills, and it seems that on some axes, uh, models even today are uh, superhuman. So for instance, if you look at the uh, poetry writing or let's say image generation for models like DALI, uh, then uh, for sure uh, they are uh, exceeding my skills. Nonetheless, actually is models in some weird way uh, they make some many of us simple mistakes. Uh, they are often they are often making mistakes in mathematics, uh, reasoning, and they seem also to be confused about what they know versus what they don't. Um, so um, the thing that uh, the 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 the. the the way how I think that the things will play out is uh, models will be uh, improving on, uh, you know, all sorts of axes, on some axes with different rate than with other. Then simultaneously will be in this situation that uh, humans in all facets of life, they will uh, augment their skills uh, with AI skills. And it will be uh, almost, you know, very wasteful for humans not to work with AI. Um, and that will be, uh, let's say, multi-year period. Uh, and then, you know, the, 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 and, and then there will come at some point the period uh, that the machine itself just like a, so vast the exceeds humans on uh, all the skills that the that uh, the the benefit from actual human work uh, is uh, is less i want to say that these are three very distinctive uh, uh, stages and i would say even the period 
where it will very closely work with AI. It will provide people a lot of feel about what AI is like. Why do we actually want to have AI around us? And it will also uh, ground the fear uh, in the, yeah, it will ground the fear in the uh, realism. So, you know, at the moment, a lot of people have this picture of AI coming from the Terminator movie. And I just think that it is like a, uh, it's, it, it just doesn't correspond to reality. And uh, we will be entering the times that pretty much everyone wants to have uh, AI in their work. Can give you an example. So uh, I remember when uh, Dali uh, was uh, released, um, some artists, they had the concern that, uh, uh, you know, that now art is over and uh, like uh, what was the point of that and so first of all um uh, so, so let's see I, I remember i started speaking with about it with uh with some of my uh artists friends who are maybe more pro technology or so so a friend uh, said that, you know, in the past, it took him three hours to maybe create a concept. At the moment, he can get it ready in, you know, a minute or so. And all of a sudden, it means that actually artists will have a tremendously bigger leverage. You know, if you want to create the exhibition, you know, in the past, it was so expensive that there are very few of them. Now, if you want to uh, completely redefine how the space looks like and how it feels, uh, that will be, you know, within the reach of any artist, which actually might mean that there is, you know, uh, more interest uh, in this uh, kind of work. And I also think that, you know, any interior designers, any folks working on brands, uh, they will actually embrace uh, AI, um, so, and, and it's also, it kind of reminds me this story uh, of when the photo camera was invented. So apparently, uh, apparently when photo camera was invented, uh, artists, they were also extremely uh, worried that now um, they will all, uh, their life makes no sense um, because you know, in the past, actually, most of the art had to do with portraits and photo camera all of a sudden was able to uh, instantaneously replicate uh, someone's you know, picture. So what's the point of portraits? Mm -hmm. And um, it actually turns out that that was the moment when art exploded and people started generating uh, things which cannot be uh, uh, achieved with camera alone. Uh, the entire contemporary art uh, uh, came to existence. And it's almost like the art that we have today uh, wouldn't be possible uh, otherwise. So uh, that's what I think will happen. I mean, one more actually analogy that struck me. Uh, so there was even a time when a computer uh, for the first time uh, won uh, with world champion in chess, uh, Gary Kasparov. And it turns out that there was like a multiple years to follow when the combination of a computer and a human uh, was uh, the, um, the best, uh, it, it was better than human alone or the computer alone. So I believe that there will be several years ahead of us uh, where people and AI 
will be able to just generate tremendous amount of wealth that, you know, artists will be uh, leveraged 100x, that scientists will be able, you know, uh, very quickly review hundreds of papers and extract, you know, critical information, plot all the, uh, uh, like, uh, compare all the experiments. And, you know, that there will be a time that actually everyone can have access to best teachers in any subject you want, speaking in any particular way you want, which is compatible with your learning methods. Everyone will have an access to the best uh, possible uh, life coaches, doctors, uh, lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a very positive future that that you envision. And and of course, there are other, uh, you know, other visions and, and fears of AI on, on the negative side. And it's sometimes hard to, um, you know, the, the range between them is is so tremendous. It's, it's very difficult to uh, sort of envision the future. Um, is there any, you know, I'm sure you have like sort of a, uh, there's no way to be certain about how the future will unfold, of course, um, but you may have some sort of probability weighted ideas of particular trends that may come to fruition um, leading to, to certain outcomes. Is there anything that you haven't touched upon yet that you think is, you know, overwhelmingly likely or, you know, very likely that would be useful even for just, you know, someone who's, like you said, you know, maybe the shoemaker or the person, you know, who opens a restaurant or or whatever it might be, like the average person to be aware of this this thing that's in in your view most likely to come to to the point where they can sort of prepare for that and um, you know, maybe be ready to to you know benefit from from advancements in AI over you know the next five, 10 plus years? Yeah, so the thing that comes to my mind is, I would almost say embrace. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that AI will go away. And, you know, I'm speaking kind of besides uh, open AI. I just believe that the, this is the, the, the trend at the moment. And uh, and I believe that actually uh, just letting letting companies and individuals explore it, I believe that it will turn out to be uh, surprisingly positive impact technology to them. Um, yeah, I also wanted maybe to give one example from uh, my own life that was quite surprising to me. Um, so I had a conversation, that, let's say I had some disagreement with my girlfriend and, uh, and I actually, I looked in uh, AI uh, to the conversation. So there was like a me, my girlfriend and AI and uh, I was quite shocked, uh, you know, by AI level of, let's say, I guess, perceived empathy or empathy or like, uh, you know, asking uh, really deep questions to at first fully understand the situation. And, uh, and then I was quite surprised by the range of possible solutions that AI gave. Um, so, you know, Often as a humans, uh, our mind gets stuck on the single way of perceiving how the thing's supposed to be. Uh, while AI, as a consequence of perhaps being uh, trained on such a vast number of people, it can uh, just bring extreme number of perspectives. So, you know, I remember seeing that there is just one solution or two, and the same for my girlfriend, while AI 
propose five or seven uh, different uh, possibilities and all of a sudden the situation stopped looking like black and white. Um, so I almost think that the uh, one interesting resource that I believe that there is a shortage in the world is for people being understood and empathized with and it's almost, you know, some of us uh, are lucky to have really close friends or therapists, but I actually believe that uh, this is not the case for everyone. And I could see the world in which uh, AI can bridge a gap and even actually provide people like a, a more let's say, a realistic or optimistic framing of the reality. It's like, a, you know, the, the the AI can help people, you know, for instance, escape victim uh, personalities or uh, see good in the world. Do you think that, you know, that's a sort of a, a vision for the future, but do you think that already with like GPT-3, for example, we've surpassed a point where, you know, to your point on in your example with, with your girlfriend, that it may actually be superior to a therapist and, you know, maybe not like the best therapists in the world or something like this, but um, should people today consider, you know, if they feel like they don't have you know, great friends to go to or family or people who understand and empathize with them. Do you think basically that GPT-3 or something else might be ready already to, to sort of fill that role for a lot of people? So I don't think that's the case yet. I believe that actually it's a matter, it's uh, still a matter of someone putting an effort and turning uh, GPT into therapist. It's a non-trivial effort. So there's like a, you know, few aspects. The, you know, one aspect is maybe providing really high quality targeted data to kind of tell the model what is, uh, you know, what are the things that are appropriate for therapists to do versus not. Then there is maybe an aspect of you would like to have a, a model that actually remembers a lot of previous interactions. And I believe that's achievable. Like, uh, and and um, yeah, and it will be also a matter of packaging it into a product. So I believe that we'll see products like that, and I'm extremely excited about products like that. And uh, you know, and I, I think that uh, that uh, models of today or you know models of tomorrow will be able to actually uh, start delivering value as therapists and i'm extremely excited about it so how do you think about the overall space of you know the top organizations that are working on ai like you mentioned you know um other people will sort of have to come along and and productize these things unless it doesn't sound like, for example, OpenAI is going to be working on, you know, an app that leverages some of the technology that you guys have come up with to create like an amazing therapist. It sounds like you guys are going to continue to focus on, um, you know, general artificial intelligence. Um, but of course, there will be startups that may do things like that. Um, and there's also, you know, a number of other sort of behemoths, um, whether it's, you know, big tech companies, uh, you know, a couple of which you've worked at in the past, Facebook and Google, Amazon, um, you know, Tesla, obviously Elon's got his, you know, was involved with the founding of OpenAI, um, others like DeepMind or Stable Diffusion, maybe even government programs. I'm curious, like, you know, obviously you're at OpenAI and, and have been there, but also had the Google and Facebook experience and I'm curious your perspective on sort of the landscape as a whole. And I know that open AI, you know, a lot of people think about it as um, the mission is sort of uh, laser focused on like AI safety. But um, I think just as much a part of your mission, correct me if I'm wrong, is like in ensuring that 
these technologies are are very widely distributed and, and don't just result in you know immense power for a few people or a few parties. Um, so and, and you know some of these organizations that I mentioned may share that belief, others may not. Uh, I'm curious your perspective on sort of the landscape as a whole and and interesting things you're you're seeing coming out of um, some of these various organizations and how OpenAI sort of views itself as part of the ecosystem. Um. Sure. So, um, so first off, uh, I would say, um, I have a conviction that if the power of AI or of AGI will be concentrated instead of distributed, actually it, uh, will have devastating uh, consequences to the world as a whole. That would be just the bad future to all of us. Um, then um, there is a question of what is the mechanism even to uh, distribute uh, wealth or AGI technology or benefits. And, and I believe that we are trying to do it in all sorts of ways. And, uh, and uh, I think that's very important. So uh, first off, um first off you know the i would like to live in the world uh where it's actually where you have million millions of companies uh building their products uh powered by ai and actually in a way we can there are mechanisms in place that uh, the ai is trustworthy so an example, if we speak about the therapist, would be you don't want to have a therapist uh, that uh, you don't want to have systems that, for, for, for instance, purely optimize for uh, you giving it thumbs up after one hour uh, conversation, uh, but maybe on some on some level can optimize for your well-being. So you could imagine that maybe you would give thumbs up if you felt happy at the end of the conversation with therapist. But actually the thing that you needed was, you know, go through the process of grieving, cry and so on. And that was actually needed uh, for the uh, for your development. So in some sense, the desired situation would be to... Uh, build systems and uh, I would say alignment mechanisms, safety mechanisms, uh, such that it's possible to ensure that the systems are behaving in the desired way. Um, OpenAI actually experiments with various ways of uh, distributing technology. So you now one way is um, we have this API in which we uh, in which we uh, provide our models. We have all sorts of safety mechanisms, and then we allow, you know, pretty much anyone to to use it. Uh, maybe given some caveats, like uh, shouldn't be used for spam or let's say terrorism and so on. Um, then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we open source uh, some of our uh, models and there is a very vibrant uh, open source, uh, I would say community at the moment. The, the way how I think about these two aspects of let's say open source versus let's say API, it's like, a, I like this analogy of thinking about the, uh, electrical uh, power plants so there are um, there are uh, nuclear power plants which seem to require a lot of scrutiny and uh, a lot of safety mechanisms uh, and simultaneously we have let's say solar power plants or uh, or uh, wind uh, or, or, or wind power plants uh, 
which you know are extremely prolific they are somewhat weaker you know anyone in theory can have their own uh, event solar panel and uh, you know we are even in the world that maybe overall energy coming from these solar panels exceeds energy coming from nuclear power plants so i would say i believe that there's actually place uh, for both of it um there is also open AI uh, created this uh, fund um, where we invest in the companies that we uh, think could have a tremendously positive impact. So this would be, for instance, if someone wants to start a therapy startup uh, working on, the, let's say, AI therapy, then uh, uh, we would be very excited investing in companies like that. Yeah. And any thoughts as to, um, you know, some of the other organizations I mentioned and, and how they may be aligned with or sort of differ from OpenAI and, and your approach? Um, you know, so just to, like like I said, some of the big tech companies or, or Tesla, um, anything, any of the organizations that are, are top of mind? Yeah, so I think that there's like a few axes of variation. So... Uh, one axis of variation has to do of uh, significance of alignment, and you know there like a, there is a spectrum of organizations. Some of them consider that that's not an important problem at all, while some other consider it to be the most important in the world. Uh, so that's one variation, and uh, in my belief, uh, as the systems advance, we'll see actually that people find out more and more that alignment is very important, that actually if we are bringing into existence, uh, you know, these clever models that will live uh, along us, we would like them to maybe on some deep level be very trustworthy. And I think it's actually very achievable. Uh, we should be able to build such a systems then second of all, there is this question about, uh, let's say, deployment. So OpenAI strongly believes that actually uh, the we want to have actually iterative process through which we deploy more and more uh, capable systems. And then uh, one, get feedback from people on what do they love, what is scary, uh, uh, what they would like the systems to be. And in some sense, you know, this is a very different feedback uh, from the, to have than, let's say, from reviewers in the scientific paper. Like if you have people who actually, uh, you know, want and they are using your system on daily basis, they deeply in their bonds understand actually what AI is. So... In some sense, I believe that it's actually, um, you know, our approach is uh, to be deploying these models and just show it to the world and let the world play with it, let the world build products, let the world actually, uh, you know, feel what they do. Um, so I would say this is the important axis. So I would say we take seriously alignment. Uh, and second of all, we think that it's actually uh, very important to to, uh, to be constantly um, to be deploying these models to the world and actually get the feedback from the uh, from the world. I think these are the uh, main axes of variation. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, and I think that's a, a very useful um, approach to answering the question is to to talk, to discuss those two um, sort of uh, axes of of uh difference uh, or, or whatever you whatever you called it but axes where these organizations may fall in a different places of the spectrum in their approach um well uh you know i i'm conscious of time and and very much appreciate uh yours uh and i know we've gone well over the scheduled time but i very much enjoyed the conversation and uh i'm just you know, I was already more intrigued by all of this just in preparing for the conversation and, and listening to your previous podcast, which I'd encourage people to go listen to if, uh, you know, if you enjoyed this one. 
And now after having the conversation with you, I'm just even more so excited about all of this and hoping to, uh, you know, learn more about uh, the space and, and what open AI is, is working on and hopefully keeping in touch with you. I, I found you to be a uh, extremely thoughtful um, podcast guest. And uh, so really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, and yeah, just appreciate you taking the time. Uh, where, where can people go to, uh, you know, follow you and, and open AI? Where do you want to point people? And uh, maybe if, if people are, are really interested and, and really enjoyed this conversation, they might like to apply to, to join open AI or, or one of your teams. Um, how could they go about doing that? Uh, cool. Yeah. So, I mean, we are always open to hire, you know, excellent, brilliant people that could help, you know, to further this, this mission, uh, of essentially bringing AI to the world and making sure that it plays out well. And uh, you can just visit openai.com website and uh, navigate to jobs. And yeah, I highly encourage you guys to apply. It's 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 the 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 environment at OpenAI is uh, really unbelievable to me when it comes to concentration of both scientific engineering and um, kind of almost like a worldview talent. There's like a many people who, so it's like a combination of people who are extremely incredible coders, mathematicians, or they have a, a stunning intuition about the models. And also many people take very seriously the philosophical and ethical questions. So I would say it's at least to me, it's just fun to be there. It feels that you know, uh, we, we are, uh, you know, we are all together in that and we are building something that deeply in my heart matters. I was going to say, sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so hopefully maybe someone's listening and, and will apply and maybe one person will, will end up uh, joining you on the team. But thank you very much again. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Uh, thank you, Jake, very much. 